many of you have probably noticed there's been quite a few advancements in the AI governance space. My head is literally spinning and I'm on bated breath until the EU AI Act text actually comes out. But on October 30th, the White House issued its executive order on AI, outlining eight priority actions the federal government must take to ensure the responsible development and use of artificial intelligence. I'm also the host of a show called Tech Hype. And in that show, we do two things. First, I sit down with experts where we debunk misunderstandings around emerging technologies, discuss the real benefits and risks, and analyze different technical and policy strategies we can implement to better ensure we harness emerging technologies for good. In addition, we've launched a series called TLDR. Who in here knows what TLDR is? A few, too long, didn't read. So I actually analyze and summarize those lengthy policies, laws, regulations that you all might not want to analyze. I analyze and summarize them in short videos. And we have a series on the White House executive order, a nine part series, one outlining the executive order in its entirety, and then eight additional going deep into each of those eight priority actions. So I really hope that you'll check out those TLDRs and share them with your colleagues. Uh, you can watch them at techhype.org. And that's with one H, techhype.org. So today we are here for a very important conversation in light of the White House Executive Order on AI. And it outlines four federal agencies, including USAID. I'm really honored to be able to introduce um, our introductory remarks today from Counselor Clinton White. Clinton White serves as the counselor for the United States Agency for International Development. He has more than 20 years of experience in the public sector and is a member of this of uh, the Senior Foreign Service. Also serves as counselor to the administrator, Samantha Power. He is the senior most foreign service officer and supports USAID's 80 missions around the world, including spearheading innovative new ways to further the mission of USAID, including ways to support digital democracy and development. I'm very excited for Clinton's remarks about how USAID is looking at the White House executive order on AI and its call for USAID to explore how it will responsibly design and deploy AI in support of its mission. Just a few more introductory remarks for Clinton. Uh, your bio is very, very well accomplished. Um, just a couple of other things here. Uh, Mr. White also uh, worked in national municipal government and a range of private sector and civil society groups, including those representing women, youth, and marginalized communities, and works very hard to improve the lives of families, communities, and countries. So with that, Clinton, I would love for you to come up and give us introductory remarks to set us up for an engaging panel discussion. Thank you so much, Brandy. And I am so happy to be here today um, on the campus of Berkeley. This is the first time that I've actually been out here. So it is actually for me uh, a great opportunity to also attempt uh, opportunity to explore the campus. So one thing I, I will say, and then I want to um, digress a little bit off of my talking points. But first, I want to thank everyone here for the introduction from Brandy and also thank you, the university of Berkeley Citrus Policy Lab for hosting this timely and important discussion. USAID, we are proud of our longstanding partnership with UC Berkeley to open up access to the latest research innovation through Development and Impact Lab, co-managed by the Bloom Center for Developing Economies and the Center for Effective Global Action at UC Berkeley. So I'm glad to be here with all of you. And when I say with all of you, and I'm glad to be here, we're also here as a larger team. And so what you will see from our delegation that's visiting Berkeley today, we have members from our mission in Kenya um, who are focusing on the digital and the technology as we're also doing outreach um, on this particular road show here in California. We have members from our Pakistan mission um, as well as distinguished um, representatives of the Fatima Jenna uh, women's University in Pakistan right here with us as they've been traveling with us throughout the country, uh, engaging and learning more to take certain things back to their country, but also how they can engage and impart their wisdom to us at universities, um, at USAID and other uh, communities. 
We also have members from our mission in Colombia. We have members from our mission in Fiji. We have members from our mission in Uganda. So as you know, USAID is very international. We have brought the international here with you as well. And I couldn't also not want to forget our DROC, Democratic Republic of the Congo member that is also here with us. So just to say that we take this very seriously and that we are all here to engage and work with you. The rapid development and an adaptation of digital technology such as AI is transforming how people worldwide access information, goods, and services. Digital technology and AI in particular has the power to spur economic growth, improve development outcomes, and lift millions out of poverty. However, AI also opens up new avenues for authoritarians and other malign actors to suppress and surveil their populations. It equips malign actors with tools to propagate false narratives and spread online hate speech and harassment at scale. And it can be used to target civilians, silence dissenting voices, and manipulate public opinion when left unchecked. The United States and other democracies have learned that our greatest assets in pushing back against authoritarianism are our core values rooted in democracy and human rights and equitable economic opportunities for all. And our technology must reflect that. AI can open up a world of potential and it presents immense opportunities for good when the design, development, and the deployment of AI tools are gender sensitive and human centered. And the potential harms are thought through and addressed well before and throughout implementation. There are many ways in which AI can advance development in humanitarian outcomes and help us achieve the sustainable development goals. I'd like to highlight some specific ways that AI can strengthen democratic processes and combat violence and authoritarian trends that can shred the social fabric of communities and countries. AI can be used to protect citizens' rights and to help prevent conflict. It can assess complex social and behavioral phenomena from human trafficking and transnational crime to violence and extremist activity rapidly at a massive scale to enable the creation of early warning systems to help protect civilians in conflict zones. It can provide avenues for social, for civil society, investigative journalism, independent media, and human rights defenders to network and communicate more effectively. It can serve as a pivotal, pivotal tool in strategically countering misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech. And in times of conflict, it can help us document atrocities and hold perpetrators accountable. Let me give you one example of what we're currently doing in Indonesia, for example, USAID has supported the development of a state-of-the-art AI system, the Misinformation Early Warning System, to identify altered and manipulated social media content and disinformation and determine how it is being spread to help counteract malign narratives. This program and others like it can help promote tolerance and harmony among diverse populations, which has the potential to decrease the risk of conflict. I also just want to mention a little bit about some of the ways that we are helping within the AI space. So USAID is also supporting the development of a civic space early warning system, which uses machine learning to forecast potential shifts toward repression of civil society and independent media and broader freedom of expression. By analyzing over 90 million news articles, the University of Pennsylvania showed that machine learning can predict the closing of civic space one, three, and six months in the future with statistically significant accuracy. This AI-powered platform is designed to provide policymakers and civil society with advanced warning of major changes in civic space across more than 50 countries. So as I mentioned, and what you will hear a little bit more about from Vera, we, USAID's AI action plan, which gets to what you were mentioning about the executive order, this plan lays out steps which we can take to responsibly engage with the potential benefits AI has to offer while managing its significant risks. These steps include constructing appropriate safeguards against risk and potential harms to communities, 
investing in talent that prioritizes a responsible approach to AI, and understanding how AI or any new technology is connected to the broader digital ecosystem and the different stakeholders there and, and how we can strengthen these ecosystems to advance responsibilities, use of technology. And consistent with this plan, USAID is partnering with development agencies from the United Nations and Canada, along with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to invest in strengthening the responsible AI ecosystem in Africa. We are also supporting the Global Index for Responsible AI, a first of its kind effort to map how over 140 countries are progressing in terms of responsible AI. So I'm not gonna sit here and speak all day to you all because I know that we have a very engaging and I'm also looking forward to the panel discussion. But I would just like to say again, thank you so much for allowing us to be here with you, allowing us to have this discussion, which is so important um, as we think about the future, but also think about the present. And as USAID, as we're thinking about our business model, what is it that we have to reimagine? What is it that we have to change as development practitioners in the way that we're doing business? We're seeing so much that has changed that this agency, it's not the same agency in the same development work that we were doing 10, 20, 30 years ago. But now we really do need to figure out how we embrace technology such as AI and other ways to effectively implement our programs and activities, but also how we're solving and creating solutions for the world. Because when it comes down to it, it is about alleviating suffering. It is about giving people hope. It is about ensuring that everyone is represented and everybody's voice is heard. But it also comes right back down to human dignity that everybody is valued in this country and around the globe. Thank you. That's you. Thank you so much, Lizen. Thank you. And if I could have the panelists come up and take your seats, I'll take this first uh, seat here, uh, the moderator seat. And while they're making their way up to the stage, um, I just wanted to pick up on some of the points that Clinton addressed. We're at this very you know, monumental time right, where we can harness artificial intelligence in ways that enables us to achieve the sustainable development goals, to be able to promote democracy worldwide. However, in that same breath, if we don't do it in a responsible manner, we risk undermining everything we've worked for. So in our panel today, we're going to talk about some of those strategies. So the way it's going to go, I'll first introduce each of the panelists. Um, I have some questions that I'll be asking, and we're going to open it up for Q&A. At about um, 11.40, I will run around with a handheld mic, so please wait to ask your question until I give you the mic because we are recording this session. So first to my left is Ritvik Gupta, and Ritvik is one of our AI Policy Hub Fellows here at UC Berkeley. Uh, Ritvik wears many hats, but we'll highlight you are an EECS PhD student currently. Uh, when are you getting close to graduation? Almost. Okay. Hopefully. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. Um, all right, and then next to Ritvik, we have Mia Moring Larson, uh, who is the Tech Advisor for Human Rights and Global Engagement in the Office of Denmark's Tech Ambassador. Are people in Denmark really excited about the EU AI Act? I think we are. <laughs> okay. I am asking you to speak on behalf of all of Denmark. I no pressure. Are. I think we're pretty ecstatic, um, but we can come back to that. Yes, I'm sure. I really hope we do. And then next to Mia is Betsy Popkin, and she is the executive director of the Human Rights Center at the UC Berkeley School of Law. Also looking at the use of AI tools, right, in your work? Yeah, machine learning. So I hope that we get into that. And then last but definitely not least is Vera Zakum, and she serves as USAID's Chief Digital Democracy and Rights Officer. So to kick us off, actually, I'd like to first go with you, Vera. Um, I have some seated questions, but just off the top of the head, I'm going to take my own moderator's uh, privilege. I'd love to hear from you. What is USAID's vision for how to responsibly develop and deploy AI systems? So, no, no sweat. Not, not, not a, not a simple question, right? Um, but seriously, for so Brandy to you and to the Citrus Policy Lab to CLTC to the Goldman School of Public Policy, to UC Berkeley writ large, 
Uh, we're so, on behalf of also you and Sandy and the council I just mentioned, we're just so delighted to be here uh, to uh, kind of showcase with our international delegation um, and really bring a, a little flavor of the world uh, and various missions that are represented here to UC Berkeley. Um, I've had, uh, before I just answer your question, uh, and what makes my work, I think, particularly exciting, um, I've had the privilege and an honor of serving as the Chief Digital Democracy and Rights Officer since uh, May of 22. But more importantly, I've been able to get on, to the field on the ground and see how things like artificial intelligence, emerging technologies, um, are actually impacting people and uh, fundamentally how this actually impacts various segments of society in all the countries that we serve. Of course, I have not traveled the world, but I've been in a few pockets that I have seen on the ground what this actually really means. So beyond all of the policy conversations, I think what I, USCID offers is the, the ability to create this connective tissue uh, what we're doing at the policy level, what we're doing through development diplomacy in the multi-stakeholder community, but also what this actually means for the people and how this impacts the people. So, Brandy, as you rightly mentioned, um, the president signed the executive order on artificial intelligence, which reaffirms the United States' commitment to developing the world's most advanced AI technologies. It also clearly positions the United States as a global leader to make sure that we are advancing and we're deploying safe, secure, and trustworthy AI. Um, and I think at the core of it, human rights has to be at the center of it. And this is what we mean when we're talking about rights respecting AI. It is everything from human rights impact assessments to development, to deployment, to even thinking about what artificial intelligence means and through the course of the life cycle but really through various iterative stages but to make sure that we're putting human rights at the center of the design process, human rights at the center of conversations um, as well, and making sure that we are, as we're thinking about artificial intelligence, it is in adherence to the international human rights commitments and principles. Um, one of the things uh, that we're doing in the development space for us at USAID is we have the USAID AI action plan um, and that action plan uh, has been developed based on years of learnings uh, from USAID and our overall development sector on the use of AI to address both development and humanitarian assistance problems. It is everything from how artificial intelligence can help with crop diseases to providing loans to financially excluded smallholder uh, farmers to addressing uh, global health issues such as tuberculosis to making sure that we're matching uh, youth, potentially at-risk youth, with jobs. And yes, it is also about how do we make sure that we're creating digital ecosystems that support democratic values and human rights, particularly in a uh, world right now where we are experiencing democratic by, uh, backsliding and civil unrest. Um, I'll just give a few examples and I'll turn it over to our other colleagues and panels. Uh, Clinton mentioned uh, the Indonesia example, which is, I will tell you, is so cool what they're doing with AI, uh, particularly in strengthening information integrity and resilience. And again, focusing on the end user, how this is actually impacting the people in Indonesia, I think we've already seen really, really great results in that. But even also um, in Georgia, um, you know, a country where um, has also seen uh, not insignificant unrest over the years, uh, but one where um, strengthening information integrity and resilience is also incredibly important. So here, what in Georgia we've done with our partners is actually develop innovation competitions and partnering also with civil society, but also the ability to deploy AI to create a speech to text transcription tools for Georgian language, video and audio, which allow researchers that focus on information manipulation, strengthening the resilience and integrity of the information environment to really detect, monitor and respond. And, you know, I'll just mention two other things. Um, one is, um, you know, we know that um, artificial intelligence, particularly uh, in development countries, also uh, can be used for good. It's also an opportunity, 
but it also can be used, if you will, negatively, particularly uh, posing risks to women and girls and through technology facilitated gender-based violence. So one really cool example I think is coming out of our uh, Latin America region is we've developed an AI chatbot called Sarah Chatbot, and it was developed uh, through, deployed through the InfoSegura regional project in partnership with the UN development program and in collaboration with USAID. And what this chatbot provides is a 24 seven cost-free information and guidance to any woman that may be at risk of violence. It is strictly confidential and enables the victim to assess, assess the situation and can turn to government or civil society uh, in her country. Right now it's deployed throughout Central America uh, and Dominican Republic. And then the other thing that I mentioned just kind of on the development diplomacy and policy in the space and how USAID is involved. Again, really thinking through the questions is how do we ensure that we do not overly automate decision-making that might impact human beings and societies? Um, how do we also ensure that we're avoiding the risk that generative AI application uh, will produce inaccurate information for USAID beneficiary. And so to answer some of these questions, USAID is very actively engaged across uh, the multi-stakeholder community, also across the US government. Uh, it's partly with sort of the AI executive order and also working with the Secretary of Commerce and the National Institute for Standards and Technology to develop the global development playbook for AI risks to complement the NIST AI risk management and framework. So let me just pause there. I know there's a lot, but suffice to say, we are really excited uh, by the order. We're also, of course, uh, eager to learn how the EU AI Act, and I'm sure you'll uh, mention a little bit about that, uh, how that will develop as well. But fundamentally, I think, of what um, we're looking to do, to do and really be part of is seeing how AI can positively uh, help society and thinking about human rights and rights respecting AI uh, throughout that development life cycle and ultimately how this actually impacts the people that we serve in our AV missions around the world. Yeah, thank you so much, Vera. I mean, one theme I'm hearing in your remarks is this idea of the need for collaboration, collaboration among partners and collaboration with those who are most affected by those technologies. So my next question is for Betsy and Mia. You both work in the human rights and tech space within academia and government. What role are those institutions currently playing in helping to develop rights respecting AI? And what roles do you see them playing in the future? I can start. Um, we are at the Human Rights Center. We're conducting a human rights assessment of generative AI with a focus on large language models. And we have brought together lawyers, human rights experts, and computer scientists to do this together. We are doing a traditional human rights impact assessment, which essentially essentially is an assessment of the human rights risks. It also identifies opportunities, but the focus is on risks um, of uh, LLM technology. And we're focusing on three fields in particular, three professional fields. The, the use of LLMs by uh, lawyers, by educators and by journalists. And um, by diving deep in those fields, we hope to elicit kind of more than the general platitudes that have been um, kind of identified thus far. And um, we'll dive deep both through kind of a scholarly analysis, but also we're heavily engaged in stakeholder engagement um, globally. Um, we've learned from, you know, a one of our, um, an expert in LLMs and law in Colombia that judges have used uh, LLMs to uh, help them make decisions in their cases in South America and Latin America. We've learned from an expert in LLMs and journalism in South Africa that journalists are using um, LLMs to help them write sports stories. We've learned from an educator and LLM expert in the UAE that educators are using LLMs to assess student work. 
So I, you know, so that just kind of shows we do the kind of literature review, the stakeholder engagement, and then kind of use our own assessment to, um, of kind of the human rights risks and opportunities that are at play. The cool thing is we are pairing it with um, what uh, we're calling a model evaluation, what Brandy has written about as a human rights algorithmic assessment. Um, but for that, we're focusing in on one particular area, investigative journalism. Um, and so what we're hoping, and that's, we have computer scientists on our team who is helping to run that. So we're pairing human rights experts up with computer scientists to develop a foundation pilot that could be um, hopefully built upon further by both us, but also uh, companies developing this technology. So that's just one example of a way that um, an academic institution get, get involved. And I really think the multidisciplinary nature of what we're doing is so key to this. Yeah, I could not agree with you more. Um, you gave the example of judges using these LLMs to help them make decisions. And we, we know full well that sometimes AI-enabled systems can perpetuate biases and discrimination. Now, the EU AI Act is a risk-based approach, right? It's looking at in high-risk areas such as sentencing, of which this would fall under. How do they identify and mitigate those risks appropriately? So, Mia, uh, you're you're facing this head on right right now with the EU AI Act. How are governments, including Denmark, how are you setting up appropriate processes to ensure that developers of these systems in high risk settings are doing um, adequate risk assessment and risk mitigation? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question, Brandy, and thank you so much for having us uh, be part of this. Even though I can't be the face of the whole EU here, I'm happy to talk to what we have been, I think, most excited about since the, at least the initial agreement on the EU AI Act. There's still lots more to come uh, the, the course of the next six months in, in 2024. Um, but one thing we have been really excited about and one thing that was a primary um, concern for them or one thing we really wanted to fight hard for in the EU AI Act was this risk-based approach. And I think it touches upon something I think you had asked us to consider before entering the panel. And it's something that we've, you know, we continuously, I think, consider when we deal with second human rights, which is this supposed tension between innovation and regulation. And we really feel like the risk-based approach, you could say, you, you would ask, like, why not the rights-based approach? And I'm a human rights advisor in our, in our tech team. And so obviously the, the fundamental rights have been front and center. But the risk-based approach is what we feel will really help us strike that balance between need oh, sorry. Um, needing to have that, needing to have an innovation ecosystem that can deliver all of these amazing opportunities and the potential that we see that AI have for so many different people to actually elevate their work and to help them do better and to release some human cognitive um, resources to do better to really advance humanity to do more uh while making sure that our citizens are safe and that we have ai we can trust so that we have ai that we can actually deploy because if we start losing that it's going to be hard for us to even i think even start actually having ai in society so the risk-based approach for us was really really important and i think we have seen that the the agreement at least from what we know now there's still lots that we don't know but from what we have seen so far and from what we understand is that they have achieved a really balanced approach um, via the risk-based approach to, to legislation. Yeah, I think that's very insightful. And I'm always happy when I hear somebody else bring up the, the trope that um, like regulation stifles innovation. It's often untrue. Some of the most regulated sectors are simultaneously the most innovative, clean energy being one example. But also this um, argument that the risk-based approach is not touching on rights, I feel like that's actually not true because the risks are based in human rights. The risks to your individual right, to freedom of thought, freedom of employment. So I think also it's a bit of a tenuous argument that we're hearing because, yeah, the, the risks are founded in human rights. Now, Ritvik, to you, Ritvik, you have worked on research looking at how do we harness dual-use technologies, of which AI, now that we have these 
foundation models. Um, as many of you may know, machine learning models up to this point were primarily trained for a very specific task. Now we have these foundation models that we can use across various domains and for various purposes. So Ritvik, in the work that you're doing, how do you think we can best harness these dual use technologies and mitigate some of those risks? Absolutely, and, and thank you, Brandy, uh, for asking the question and, and for having us here today. Um, my career is focused on AI for humanitarian assistance and disaster response, both building technologies to address uh, use cases uh, in this world of HADR, as well as in addressing the integration and impact of these technologies into the user base, right? So firefighters, humanitarian rights investigators, et cetera. And there's been an amazing sort of uh, uh, influx and, uh, and, and uh, uh, onboarding of these tools across multiple sectors of this entire field. Things, you know, some of my research, for example, in includes how do we assess building damage from space? We're some of the first people to do that. And now that's something that you see being used all around the world. The, the DOD does it, Department of State does it, USAID is doing it to figure out how many buildings were damaged in, let's say, Gaza, you know, what has been done. But like you mentioned, all of these come with a, a very, a very dual use nature. The, the models are pretty generic. You know, the exact same model that I used to do detection of critical infrastructure for targeting purposes, right? I go to GitHub, I download Yolo V8, is the exact same architecture I used to do damage assessment. The only thing that changes between those two things is the data that I trained it on. And even in those cases, the data is largely the same. It's just that the labels I gave the model were slightly different. And so it, it raises a very important question. If we were to give uh, you know, some uh, uh, country in, in, in the world uh, access to very powerful uh, uh, AI model that is meant for humanitarian purposes. Let's say we give you know some country a model that can do flood segmentation to tell you how much flooding has happened and which buildings were impacted, how much will it cost to reconstruct. Can that same country then use that model for military purposes or for for rights oppressing purposes? Right? Can I then start using the same model to then start targeting uh, vulnerable populations in those same flooded areas? It's a big question, and, and it's one that I don't think many people are currently looking at. Somebody suggests we do. <laughs> because, right, the, your argument is absolutely spot on. This technology can be used for good and for bad. We see this also in, in surveillance software in countries where we're surveilling to identify terrorists, and it just so happens those governments then often turn that technology on political dissidents and journalists, Mexico being a big perpetrator of this. So how can we mitigate this, the, in, the malicious intent? Or can we not? To a degree, to a degree, I think we can. To a large degree, I think we cannot. But I think that you know, at least from the perspective of some of the organizations who are creating technologies, we can put measures in place to make sure that we have some sort of you know some sort of kill switch, uh, or some sort of reporting mechanism that ensures that that we know what is being done with this model at all times. For example, when we distribute our models, we make sure that people sign up on a website to download them. They say what organization they're with, we verify them, and then we let them download that. In the future, if they end up using it for bad things, we can cut off their access. The other thing I can, I think that we can do on a larger basis is, is stop making sort of long-term policy decisions based on short-term tech trends. Um, and maybe just to- Amen. <laughs> maybe exactly, like everybody, yeah, everybody's focused on generative AI. We got machine learning models causing damage already. Yeah. yeah, actually, maybe just to highlight that, uh, how many of you have heard of LLMs, show of hands? Most of you. Y'all engage with them. How many of you uh, are currently working on integrating LLMs into your current workflows or working on writing policy for how to make sure generative AI is used responsibly within your organizations? Another show of hands. <laughs> Fantastic. How many of you have heard of LMMs? None of you. It, they stand for large multimodal models. As it turns out, L, no one is working on LLMs anymore. LLMs are dead. LLMs are no longer the hot stuff. Um, LLMs are, are the new thing. If you look at GPT-4, GPT-4V specifically, if you look at some of the new capabilities coming up quad, you look at all of the research that's not coming out of Berkeley AI research, it's on large multimodal models. No cutting edge AI researcher is, is even bothering to look at LLMs anymore. Yet our organizations, our governments, our our NGOs are still trying to wrap their head around what an LLM is, how they can use responsibly, while the world has already moved on from them. And so if we make policy decisions of how to integrate these technologies now on the short-term tech trend, we'll be locking ourselves into suboptimal decisions for years to come. Yeah. 
I totally agree with you. And I'm going to open up this question to the three of you that focusing primarily on one type of artificial intelligence, even in the state of California, we had the executive order issued by Governor Newsom with a heavy focus on generative AI, which is extremely short-sighted. Now, for the work that you're all doing, in, in light of what Vic is saying now, how can we best position ourselves to be able to harness these LMMs and the LM and no peace in the future? <laughs> um, how, how might we be able to, given our experience right now of setting up a responsible AI strategy, be better positioned to quickly and efficiently on-ramp new technologies in the future? I can answer. Um, you know, we chose LLMs um, because in kind of the three professions we were looking at, those are kind of most um, utilized. Uh, I could see in the future definitely expanding that to include LMMs as well. Um, so I think in the academic space, uh, we need to stay ahead of the curve. Um, you know, there's always a question of like, when does the funding come? And so I think in that respect, like it, you know, it can lag because of that. Um, but I, I think academic institutions are in a unique space where we can stay ahead of the curve. Yeah. And I guess I'll just speak from U.S. aid and, uh, U.S. government, honestly, the one of the ways to stay ahead of the curve is investing in the workforce and in youth and in the people to really understand this technology and in, and making sure also that we are in various countries around the world are investing both in public interest technologists right in terms of workforce development but also in the technologies who can say because we know this stuff is moving way faster than we can even imagine so i'll just give one plug in an example and that is uh during the first and the second summit for democracy we are not we announced our signature marquee initiative called the advancing digital democracy initiative and in some respects in various countries we've done pilots in serbia and zambia now it's going to be in a number of countries by the end of 24 but the point being is it kind of helps with this as well it's not just helping partner governments with and making sure legal and regulatory um uh, sort of standards and reforms and making sure we're upholding international human rights commitments, but also investing in public interest technologies and technologists and making sure civil society is also uh, equipped, if you will, to be able to understand and to learn. So I think this is not just you know, also at the technical level, but I also think this presents, it's not a challenge, I actually think this presents an enormous opportunity around the world and making sure that we are investing both in the workforce, in education, and in understanding, back to my earlier point, that fundamentally we know we have to think about the end user and who this is impacting. And we know that this is impacting very different diverse sectors of the population, so through children, to youth, to a woman, to uh, you know um, people with disabilities and you know racial and ethnic minorities, whatever. You know, So I think that piece has to be back. Yeah, I think that's absolutely important. And in the executive order, right, it initiated a large hiring um, initiative within the federal government to attract that talent. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission has had for years now a technologist hiring program. And one thing I want to point out is that social scientists are included in that. Because we cannot, as was said before, it has to be a multidisciplinary approach. We cannot just have technologists, but we have to have those public interest technologists, those who understand the socio-technical aspects. Within um, Denmark, let's say, I won't make you uh, talk about all of you <laughs> again, but are there similar initiatives to bring on that tech talent into government? So one thing we did, and I, I think maybe jumping from the multidisciplinary to the multi-stakeholder, one thing we really tried to champion uh, within the, the Danish MFA, but broadly in our government, and something that we are very, we consider a Danish position of strength is working among public private partnerships or public public private civil partnerships, I should say. Um, so something we did a couple of years ago, very knows as well, we worked a lot on, on kind of similar um, issues there, but we launched this Tech for Democracy initiative, which was part, it was our biggest contribution to the Summit for Democracy, where we said, what 
what what can Denmark do to kind of help build this momentum of saying that we need governments and companies and civil society speaking about these issues together, not just defining the solutions, but defining the problems. And I think what we still are seeing, especially in AI, I think one thing is saying to the platforms, which was, I think, the primary issue we were speaking about like three years ago, two years ago, and then enter AI. And I think it's true that what you know what you're hearing that people are saying about governments is that we can maybe spell AI, but we can't really understand mm -hmm. it. And I don't know how far we've still moved to really understanding it. And even though there, I, I agree that there is, we need to do a better job of doing that. We need to have more folks in governments that understand technology. That's part of the reason why we have a tech ambassador and we have a team out here to solely focus on that, to bring that expertise to policymakers so we don't do wrong policies. But I also think that we need to recognize, especially with AI, that I don't think that we're ever going to be you know, we're not going to be experts at the same level that the private sector or academia is going to be. There, there is still a need for activists, human rights activists, social scientists, governments, folks that should be part of this conversation, even though we do not understand the technical aspects. Because in the end, it's not only a technical uh, discussion, it is a discussion about what is the technology we want in society. And I think so while we're talking about upscaling, I think we need to remember that this is not just a technologist conversation, but we do need those other voices too. Yeah, Vera. Oh yeah, if I could just add to what Mia said, um, I will plus a thousand to Mia. <laughs> We've been working together for a number of years now um, and with Anne Marie as well. I cannot underscore how important this multi-stakeholder approach is. And this is not just in all the different convenings that we have, you know, and uh, signing, you know, principles and commitments, yes. But this multi-stakeholder approach with the idea that no government, no private sector entity, no academic institution, uh, civil society organization can solve this wicked problem of what we're going to, how should we be deploying AI responsibly and other emerging technologies by itself. But I will also, if you will, invite you as a rep senior representative of USAID to think about how this actually impacts development and other countries, particularly lower and middle income countries around the world. Because those multi-stakeholder coalitions and partnerships must happen also at the country level, at the local level, to make sure that we are designing the exact right solutions. I see my wonderful com a colleague, our mission director here, from Fiji, who I had the pleasure of uh, visiting Fiji. Which, this is our newest, uh, one of the newest missions for USAID that the administrator uh, launched in August of this year. And when I was there just a few months ago, we were talking about that. How do we actually get rights respecting technologists to focus on these issues? How do we get you know, government and civil society organizations? And I think we need more of that in addition to amazing work we're doing at the um, not just uh, in this country, but also with our, you know, European colleagues and other partners around the world. Yeah, thank you so much, Vera, for that point. Now, I'd like to be a little bit provocative and actually um, push back on some of this. It happens to be that I did my dissertation on multi-stakeholder governance models, looking at the Internet Governance Forum and its role in shaping policy. Now, it's a non-binding forum. It's not actually supposed to influence policy. And I did my work in the East African community, Burundi, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya. And in that research, I found that while all are equal, some of the table are more equal than others. And they are, there are definitely players setting the precedent. The reason why we have the term foundation models in legislation now in the EUAI Act is because of our friends over at Stanford coined that term. And there was pushback on whether or not that term was appropriate for characterizing that type of model. Also, the, the private sector, even the EU AI Act, it does put in place requirements, but there is so much room for those companies to demonstrate what compliance looks like, which means they can essentially, hate to say this, but they can write the exam by which they are graded. Now, of course, there's transparency reports that they'll have to issue, and I'm hopeful that the EU will evaluate those and wave their finger at them if they don't think that they've done an appropriate job. 
So we, we talk a lot about stakeholder engagement and multi-stakeholder processes. Now, I'm a cynic because I've done my research on it and I don't want to be. I want this process to work. How can we make it work? How can we actually really ensure that multi-stakeholder convenings are bringing people together on equal footing where everybody can play in the sandbox collaboratively and work together? And on top of that, I'd like to get at how do we actually meaningfully engage those people who are directly affected? So if I may, um, I, I think I share your cynicism, Randy, and also your hope that, you know, we- I did not sound very hopeful, but yeah, I'll try. <laughs> we, we do want these multi-stakeholder engagements to work. And, and, and at a fundamental level, we have no option but to engage in multi-stakeholder engagements because that is the only right way forward, right? As a, as a government, as academics, we want to bring in all the voices in the, in the world so that we can make the most informed decisions. However, like you said, some parties are more equal. Than yeah, others. can I interject on that? Because I also think, I'm so sorry, I'm going to be a big cynic today. I think often sometimes the multi-stakeholder approach is used as a, a cover for back channeling and having certain stakeholders like industry go into these multi-stakeholder convenings, pitch their idea of how, oh, Sam Altman. Okay, let's take Sam Altman testifying before Congress on chat GPT. Essentially, he wasn't doing it out of the goodness of his heart, saying that I built this powerful tool that's going to cause harm to society. No, he went before them to say, look, I'm best positioned to govern and oversee this technology. There's no need for you to intervene. I can do it best. We're going to keep it closed. Keep the model closed because if we keep it open, it will cause harm. People can identify the model weights and be able to reverse engineer and make these really bad things happen. So first, he did two things. He's trying to get Congress to not regulate him. And then number two, by making it closed, and it's proprietary, it's his. Yeah. So on, on that note as well, right? Like there, we've heard of greenwashing. There is a lot of multi-stakeholder washing now yes. where companies will host, you know, stakeholders from around the world, say that they did it, and then go and push their agenda anyways. The reason we have frontier models now is because OpenAI and their group of friends got together and said, Foundation models are dangerous because it suits us the best. And so we need to make sure that con Congress people and policymakers have some sort of word they can use for this terrible technology to regulate it. That's not what stakeholders said. That's n stakeholders didn't even know what the dangers were, but open had a mission. You know, these state, these, these people had, had, had an agenda and they pushed it and they said, all of our stakeholders agree. That's really what we need, right? What we can, what I think what we can do about it. Is, is not just sort of set, set up these multi-stakeholder engagements on our side, but really push out the training, the culture that's needed for people at these companies to honestly and sincerely engage in these multi-stakeholder engagements to begin with. I don't think you can change the leadership, but you can change the people who work in these companies for the right reasons. And if you give them the tools necessary to build these engagements on their own and actually act upon those outcomes in a totally objective um, and sort of formulaic manner even, um, I think that the leadership has no choice to f follow that because there's a standardization that we've in like instilled it into the field itself. Yeah, but like you said, lots of cynicism and multi-stakeholder engagement. Um, and I'll get to Betsy and then Mia. Just a quick pitch. I had mentioned before that Rutvik is one of our AI Policy Hub fellows, and this is actually what we try to do in the AI Policy Hub. We recruit a cohort of students, multidisciplinary. So we have students from social science, engineering, statistics, across campus, bring them together. They work on very technical AI research projects, but we train them to understand and value social science, the other disciplines, and teach them how to translate their research into policy deliverables. That's a program that we would love to scale. Uh, we have the curriculum. If anybody's interested in learning more about it, please come see me after. So let's get to Betsy and then me. I should also mention Ritwick as a Human Rights Center fellow. So. Told you, Ritwick. <laughs> is everywhere on campus <laughs> for good reason. Um, so it's not perfect, but I thought I'd kind of talk a little bit about what we're doing in, on stakeholder engagement in our project, because I think it's at least a step in the right direction. Um, so I mentioned we are doing global stakeholder engagement, um, and we have also included a number of those stakeholders on our advisory. So they are also helping to shape uh, the decision making and the work that we're doing, um, which I think is an important element of it too. 
And once we draft our white paper, we will also be reviewing it by all of them. So we're trying to integrate those stakeholders, not only by talking to them and hearing and listening to them, but also by including them in the decision making and the final outputs of what we're doing. Could it say Mia? I think I just feel like I, I need to respond to your cynicism and please do make, bring <laughs> us hope maybe give some hope but also I think um from kind of where I'm sitting and what I'm seeing I, I wanted to just mention the the whole multi-stakeholder washing let's call it that I think was exactly the reason why we wanted to take it from being just a buzzword to show in practice what it actually means uh, when we launched this Tech for Democracy project a few years back, we did that one by developing a Copenhagen pledge, which shows like a vision for what digital democracy or what a digital future based on democratic values and human rights looks like. That process included 170 actors that were part of developing that. And it's, we think by starting there, because we do need to first agree on, do we even have a shared, and I think this applies absolutely for AI too, do we even have a shared like risk perception or a shared perception of what the challenges are. And then we can start working on the solution. So the second thing we did was we launched, um, we called them action coalitions. We launched one together with the, with the USG on uh, gender-based facil- gender online violence. It has a long name. Um, and we were still leading one on in information integrity, but the basis for those action coalitions was that they have to include, they don't have to be enormous, but they have to include at the core one from each stakeholder group to sit together, define the problem, and then find the solution. And that was really to showcase what we can do and how we can do things better. I don't think I could, I, I, I think I honestly have to say as a government person, I don't know how people do their job without speaking to other stakeholders, especially in this field. I We would be doing very dumb things if I, if I wasn't <laughs> consulting civil society, academia, also companies all the time. But I do see your point, and I think there are two things to the asymmetry there. One thing is how difficult it still is for civil society to not just get a seat at the table. They can do that now. I think they can actually quite easily get a seat at the table. The question is whether we listen to them or not. And we actually, you know, take what they say and put it in there and actually act on it. And then I think, the other thing is really, I think the power relationship between governments and companies is one of the key reasons why we have something called tech diplomacy, which is what we think that we're doing, is that we need to understand the relationship between governments and companies today and the asymmetry of power, of expertise, is something we have to factor in. I don't think that that means that we, you know, we, we have to try and figure out how we can use that to our advantage or at least engage in a meaningful way. And, and then there's the whole internal process. Can we change something within the companies? But but just to say, I think the most stakeholder model, it's still the best we got. It's not perfect, but I think we can work our way there and really forge those relationships to become more trustful. Right. Thank you so much. And I guess like the Grinch, my heart has grown two sizes from <laughs> hearing you. Yeah, that, yeah. I, uh, yes, I'm, I'm getting uh, more hopeful as this... Uh, discussion moves on. Um, I was going to ask Vera if you wanted to make a comment right as you take a sip of water. No, um, Mia, you just also reminded, um, you also reminded me in another thing that we did also coming out of the Summit for Democracy, and that is, and we actually launched it at Internet Governance Forum, ironically in Kyoto, um, and that is along with our Canadian colleagues, and that is the donor principles for human rights in digital age. And those donor principles, we they were um, negotiated, if you will, non-binary principles through the Freedom Online Coalition, but signed by 38 partner governments that are part of the FOC and very essentially and heavily consulted by so many members of civil society. And again, to me, I could kind of go back to that intentionality, you know, that yes, we need to make sure that all the different stakeholders and on the privates that are at the table, but to me also the private sector, let's just not talk about the big tech. It's so important to bring in the emerging, like we're talking about AI here, it's just so important to bring emerging technologies that are actually 
really thinking intentionally, developing those rights respecting solutions, if you will, or ones that are actually thinking about risk, not ones that are just based in the United States, including in the great state of California, but also the ones that are popping up all over the world in various parts of the world, including ones that are part of the global majority. And I think, you know, why that's really important, part of the multi-stakeholder, kind of going back to that kind of localized solutions of the multi-stakeholder model, model and because context matters. These are the organizations, whether we're talking about civil society or emerging technologies, private sector actors on AI and other emerging tech that really understand the culture, really understand the language models, and really understand that cultural nuance. And it's just, um, it's just a matter of actually being on the ground. Um, I know, uh, Counselor, I will quote you uh, one time that I know we've talked and with a lot of, we have a lot of our uh, uh, leaders uh, from around the world here. And that is, it's just so important to be on the ground. And it's so important to show up partic and be part of those intimate conversations, particularly when we're dealing with authority issues like AI, because we can sit here in this unbelievably gorgeous and prestigious place, the University of California, Berkeley, but this, but in and just incredible research that's done across all the different, you know, centers and, you know, that um, this university represents. But just being able to bring those on the ground experiences, particularly as we're thinking about this and particularly when we're thinking about the multi-stakeholder coalitions. So then when we are as governments and we're sitting together with private sector and with civil society, whether it's the Summit for Democracy or the Internet Governance Forum or another Freedom Online Coalition uh, convening, whatever it might be, right, or the, um, the UK Safety Summit, whatever it might be, we're can bring those lived and learned experiences to the table. Thank you, Vera. I want to pick up on one point that you expressed, um, this responsibility around investment. What do we invest in? Now, there is a stakeholder that we often don't bring up, but is very important, and that's venture capitalists. And venture capitalists control the companies that grow. And there has been studies showing that a lot of these startup companies, you know, they put AI in their title, but there was really no machine learning there. So Ritvik, can I ask you, how do we effectively evaluate whether or not there's something real there? A, and it's not vaporware. B, like you've said, nobody's looking at LLMs anymore. It's LMMs. So now that you've heard all of that, you're probably going to start seeing it right, in the news, LMMs. So how do we know what to invest in? This space is moving so quick. How do we evaluate them and where should we be invested? Yes, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, so outside of Berkeley, I serve as a technical director uh, for autonomy at the U.S. Department of Defense's Defense Innovation Unit that's based out of here in Mountain View. Um, and our job at the IU is to bring in the latest and greatest commercial technologies into the DoD as, as sort of in this model of what we call fast follow. Industry invents and DoD follows as fast as possible. And my job as a technical director is to make sure that we do evaluation on these technologies to make sure they're not vaporware and that they're solving the real problems that the DOD really cares about. Um, and honestly, uh, the process is relatively ad hoc. The way we do it is uh, companies submit to us their pitch decks. We select from them. You know, We have a whole competitive process. That's what DI is known for. And then when we bring them on site, uh, we sort of get at them with a group of technical experts, which include our team. It includes teams from our partners across the U.S. government. We start asking them specific, very specific questions about their intellectual property. We could not do that if we didn't have access to the world leading experts in whatever the technology is in house at DIU or across the US government. And when we don't have it, we make sure to bring them in through partnerships with, with FFRDCs like Carnegie Mellon or MIT uh, or, or you know, the national labs. And so, really, the only way to make sure that things aren't vaporware, um, especially when people are saying all the right buzzwords and bringing all the flashy demos is to meet them head on with equivalent or even better experts that we're able to pull across from from industry. And so like you mentioned, you know, this multi-stakeholder model, we try to bring in all the different stakeholders, all the experts, all the people who are going to be impacted by that technology. So in our case, the warfighter who is actually going to be using technologies in the room with us as people are pitching and we get them to say like, hey, gut check, you're a combat controller, you're in the field, you're going to be calling in airstrikes. Would you use this? Is this right? And equivalently, Hey, you're an AI researcher at Berkeley. Does this tech actually work? Is this how optimization is, is, is properly trained? 
and together we think that we usually make the right decisions. Um, I wish there was a more formal process, but that's the best we have. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, not only engaging the multi-stakeholders, but also it's throwing your procurement weight around, right? Because those companies, they need you a lot more than you need them oftentimes. They're going to come to you and say, oh, you have this challenge. We're going to build this tool for you. It's a silver bullet. It's going to solve everything. You have a lot of power to put pressure on them to be transparent on what they're actually building. We're working with the University of California for 10 campuses. We serve millions of people. We are a big procurer, and we are pushing that weight onto those entities to demonstrate to us that they are doing their due diligence and risk assessment and risk mitigation. If I could, if I could add to that, uh, that's a great point. You know, one of the things that you know, DA's been around for about six years now. Uh, I've been them for about four and a half. And one of the things that I'd always see in the start when we were a small organization is companies would come and pitch to us the same style they'd pitch the rest of the DoD, right? These super fancy pitch decks, like over bloated promises, no technical details, reading off of a script with these dudes in very nice suits. Um, <laughs> and it would be nothing of, of interest. And so when we kept repeatedly saying, you're not getting a contract, sorry, you're not moving on to phase two, let alone phase three, they eventually got the message that we mean business. You better come with your technical experts and not your salespeople, you know, the dudes in button downs and not the dudes in the suits, um, and, and really give us- I mean, Patagonia. Sure. That's right. Now, yeah, Patagonia, Pataguchi, as we call it, uh, <laughs> and uh, and really get down to, to the to, to the nitty gritty rather than just giving us overall message. So you know, even in even in USAID, even in Department of State, etc., we can do the same thing. There's no reason why we have to accept the status quo of how things are pitched to us. Kun's got a question. Oh, actually, wait. Let me give you the. <laughs> yeah, I mean. We are at the Q&A portion. So um, if you have any final remarks to the three of you, I'm going to actually help facilitate the Q&A and run around in the audience with this mic. So Clinton, did you have something you wanted to say? No, I was just thinking about the I hope you brought the Patagonia vest. <laughs> no, no, after you first. No, no. So. Hello, my name is Robinson Cook. I'm a senior humanitarian assistance officer with the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance at USAID. So I deal with a lot of, uh, I have participated on a number of field uh, level disaster responses from uh, migration crisis to the war in Ukraine, uh, wildfires and so on. So I just want to bring some positivity and let you know that I just came back from a South American country, two of them. 10 days ago, we were talking about the open source technology that is available to identify the conditions in which a wildfire will start. And our counterparts who are basically like FEMA, they were surprised at the, at the, uh, the accuracy with which our wildfire people could predict that something was going to happen. So I know that there's a lot of hand wringing about AI and how it can be negative, but it can also be life-saving because our conversation with them was what we're seeing so far is you're going to have a pretty tough fire season coming up here in February and March, and you need to get prepared. You need to do some awareness out there to the public. So I just, that's a positive situation. And then I think your question was, how do you, uh, technologies that are getting out there, as you were talking about, that could be used for collapsed buildings. Uh, how do you stop that from a government from using that stuff for bad for USA BHA, you know, we do not fund government. So I want to make that real clear. So there needs, and, and we our humanitarian principles, our neutrality, impartiality, and independence. And within this federal, we lead and coordinate all humanitarian responses across the government. And so as part of that, we have to also respect the sovereignty of nations. It's easier said than done, but I can tell you when you're sitting out in a mission and you're talking to your counterparts, you can't just do what you think. Uh, it's not that you don't can't do what you think is right, but you just can't do any old thing. So there's coordination that needs to go on out there. So I'll just say that. Uh, we do have people that sit in the combatant commands, all of them like SOCOM, uh, in Tampa Bay or PACOM or AFRICOM. And we sit there with the generals and we make sure that they understand what the humanitarian imperative is, especially 
in the aftermath of a hurricane, an earthquake, a flood, whatever it is. I'm not saying we always win or we always get our way, but we are there. That interagency coordination helps to make sure that humanitarian principles are uh, held up. And I'll stop there. Over. Did anybody want to respond to him? Or? Oh, all right. Let me go. I think. Um, so one question I have, maybe for all of you, when we talk about policy, we talk about implementation and strategy. Um, it'd be interesting to get some of your perspectives on what you see or what you saw taking place in like West Africa, where you saw so much propaganda, so much of AI and mis and disinformation being used that sort of, you know, we saw this, you know, the next domino of the coup taking place. But not only that, but we saw, you know, citizens, you know, the populations of these countries really impacted by what's happening, not only from, you know, Russia, or, um, but also the PRC. And we think about, you know, who might be next or what region might be next. So what are some of the things when you're thinking about this um, collectively or single, you want to be multi, uh, but what are some of the things that we should be looking at especially when we're not talking just about governments, but we're speaking more about, you know, the regular citizens and the communities. I feel like you've got the most expertise here. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I would say that, um, well, if someone wants to answer it, I, I still need to think through it. Do you want to answer from a technical perspective and then I can answer from a human rights perspective? Yeah, certainly. Um, as you mentioned, even in your opening remarks, Clint, the, mis the spread of misinformation, disinformation is a huge problem and one that we're actively trying to tackle here in the technical realm, right? How do we build technologies that can not only uh, detect the spread of misinfo and disinfo, but also start, you know, things like watermarking, things like uh, the provenance information. How do we roll these things out into the the tech sector? So you know we have fantastic faculty member here at Berkeley, Honey Farid. He's pretty infamous for building some of these different things. Um, and one of the things that he's really been been working on and pushing for is something called the Content Authorship Initiative. Um, and what the Content Authorship Initiative is is essentially similar to how you uh, currently browse websites. When you log into your bank account and you see that lock on the top left, you trust it. You say that is a secured website. It's been trusted by the browser. It's been trusted by the people who sign that certificate and it's trusted by the bank. We want to do the same exact thing for content. So when I take a picture with my phone, when I build something in Photoshop, there's going to be a certificate that is permanently embedded within that file that says that this was built by an iPhone. It was edited by Photoshop and is now being presented to you in its intended location of Twitter. Right, and you click on that lock and that entire provenance structure will show up. So getting these things adopted um, across not just the developed worlds, but also developing countries such as in West Africa, I think will go a long way towards stopping the spread of misinfo and disinfo. There's a user piece to it, making sure that users understand how to use that technology, how to always verify that whatever they receive from their uncle on WhatsApp is actually a legitimate piece of information and not just something that was you know, made on the fly. Uh, but we're trying to do this uh, in, in the technical world, and therefore the policy will then very rapidly follow. How do you mandate that rollout? How do you mandate the training and the education required around it? Um, but in terms of how do you actually stop it once it's spreading, like it's people are already believing it, that is entirely a question I cannot answer. Yeah. I um, So from the human rights perspective at the Human Rights Center, we, in any place around the world where we work, uh, we first put boots on the ground um, and we talk to the people to assess what their needs are. Um, and so that's an area where USAID is really well positioned because you also have people everywhere around the world. And so I think really getting a sense from people in a community, you know, when before the uh, genocide started in Myanmar, we had people on the ground there talking to people and monitoring content of Facebook and seeing kind of the hate um, speech arise. And so I think talking to people on the ground and also monitoring 
And maybe, you know, maybe it's working with companies and universities to monitor um, what's happening in kind of um, on kind of major platforms. Um, but I, I think it really is opening up that dialogue and conversations with people in the places um, where it's happening and creating systems to monitor um, what's happening to be able to stop it. Can I offer just, I think, one more thought? It was something that you said that made me think about an experience I had um, moving from Copenhagen to this place a year ago, having worked on the same issues, understanding some, understanding much more after having been here for a year on um, information and security, which is something that we're working a lot on as well. And was, I think, really one of the key drivers for why we started Tech for Democracy is that most of our reality, or if not all of it, is shaped by what we see online. And right now, it's extremely overwhelming. I think most, most people just feel overwhelmed when you open your computer or you look on your phone and you go to whichever one of the social media platforms you typically use. And with, with Gen AI now making it increasingly more difficult for us to tell what's true or not, and I think most of you are familiar with the whole liar's dividend, of like the, the fact that truth itself or everything that you see online can be called into question because we frankly don't know what's true or not. I think an eye-opener for me of coming out here is being familiar with the trust and safety community. So besides from all the good efforts that are going into watermarking and using actually AI to figure out how can we detect this information and take it down, the community out here, both within academia, but also in the companies that are working to figure out how can we introduce frictions onto the platforms that can make people better engage with information? Because right now, even, even if we take stuff down, it doesn't matter. I've already seen it and I have my human bias, so I'm going to believe it anyways. So figuring out how we can make people better information consumers, but helping them by figuring out. And to do that, we need to put a lot more research and investment, but that means companies too, right? Something that we hope but we don't know yet. Can the DSA, so the Digital Services Act of the EU, can that have an effect in pushing more investment into trust and safety within the companies to figure out what are the proper types of frictions we can introduce on the platforms that are going to make people kind of stop up or think a little bit about the information they're consuming. Um, so that's something that's going to be really important to us and something that we keep having conversations with the companies about is how do we drive that? How do we how do we make, I mean, a lot of companies are also saying right now that, you know, we're investing more and more in trust and safety and we don't really know, but, you know, it's something that we're excited to see. And we hope, again, that, this, that the DSA can have that effect of pushing more investment into that, because I think a lot of the answers, I hope so, fingers crossed, or else I don't know what we're going to do in 2024. If I may tease out one more point from that, and I'm sorry, I know there's more questions, but yeah, just one very small point here. I, I think a, another critical issue that's facing us is just a degradation in truth, right? In the sense that people don't care about the truth anymore. Like, I know that I created a Gen AI meme of Obama doing something crazy, but it fits my set of beliefs. So I don't care if it's fake. I know it's fake, but it's set, it fits my bubble and I'll continue believing it. And so there's this big social issue of how do we get people to believe in the truth again and, and understand the truth matters, right? And opinions don't matter you know, uh, your your beliefs don't matter. It's the cold, hard truth that matters. That is a big question. Can I just say that truth has been manufactured in the history? <laughs> <laughs> truth is not true to everybody. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, not sure how to follow that. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Adon Katz of Ethical Intelligence. Um, Thank you for hosting this and very refreshing in this overwhelming amount of information that's coming out, a uh, conversation focused on the global majority, um, which is not frequent enough. So my question is actually um, tailored towards data colonialism, which um, hasn't really been part of the conversation. Two parts to that, the proprietary nature, the intellectual property ownership by um, Silicon Valley of the data sources that come from elsewhere. Um, also the openness of uh, the models and whether they are contextually relevant to uh, the particular place where we're from. So a lot of this conversation has been generalized about uh, AI policy. Um, in regards to 
uh, social and economic development, um, the concern of data colonialism to me is shocking that it's just not discussed at all. I was wondering if you had any insights on what we can do now rather than five years from now when the problem's already um, uh, shown to be so deeply embedded. Uh, I don't have insights into what we can do, but I can tell you that's come up in the work that we're doing because we're trying to take a really global approach and, you know, different languages are represented in different ways. We're looking at four different large language models, one being ChatGPT. And, uh, you know, when we're talking with people in certain countries in Africa, you know, languages are just well, less well represented. Um, and so uh, that is kind of one of the risks involved is, you know, is the information those people have access to being limited? Um, is it, you know, discriminatory that they don't have access to the same resources as a result? So I, I don't know how to fix that. I feel like that is maybe more of a technical question. But I mean, that's by virtue of like information out there, open source information out there. Is it predominantly in English and therefore it's going to be used? Uh, and, and so I, yeah, I, I don't have an answer, but I can, um, I understand the issue. You know, we're, we we deeply worry about data colonialism on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, I sort of view it as sort of like a civilization game tech tree issue, right? Like America, a long time ago, invested deeply into its intelligence and surveillance capabilities. Our companies that then grew from that also had a value for the collection of data. Google collects data, Microsoft collects data, Maxar collects data. And so some of the world's best data collection companies are U.S.-based. They make it clear that any data they collect is owned by them, but then they're collecting data from countries everywhere in the world. So when I am in Malawi and I want to access information about my farms, I don't go to the Malawi government. I go to Maxar and I say, give me a satellite image of a farm in Malawi, right? Owned by a U.S. company. And if I'm a Malawi farmer who wants information about my own farm, where do I go for that data? I go to America for that data. I don't go to Malawi for that data. It's a huge issue. And... There's, there's a portion of this where U.S. companies are totally aware they're global actors. They like being global actors. It gives them a great sense of ego to be global actors, but then refuse to be actual global stewards, right? They don't want to then, then give back to that same global community that they're getting that data from. And so what we really need more than anything else in a very multi-stakeholder fashion is for governments, organizations in, in, in places around the world, such as in Denmark and the EU, to say, Really, like enough is enough. Like you need to start playing by our rules. You need to give back to your own communities and find ways to put everyone on equal footing again in terms of access to data, right? Understood that U.S. invested in this very heavily years ago, but in order for equity to sort of prevail, we need to make sure that those mechanisms are now divested across the community. And I have three people lined up, so here, there, there, blue. Do you want to take Do you want to take questions at the same time, or then have us respond, or one at a time? Yeah. So good. Yeah. Uh, good morning, and thank you so much uh, for this uh, um, session. My name is Daniel Nyanduchi. I am uh, based in Uganda currently. So I have a quick question for you, and more for me, really trying to understand how we can deploy AI in a practical manner in a country like Uganda, uh, where we have a closing civic space, although some would argue the space has already closed. Uh, we have a government that's cracking down, or continues crack crack down on civil society organizations, uh, journalists, and so on and so forth. Uh, I know I heard somebody talk about that. Uh, uh, LLMs and working with journalists and others, um, but would really like to understand how, in what ways, what should we be thinking about as we look to the next phase of our programming as a, as a, as USAID in Uganda? How do we incorporate AI? Where do we begin? Where should we begin? 
I really, I'm really looking for practical solution. And it's not solution, whatever it is, practical advice, uh, because this is something that's very um, uh, near and dear to us as we look towards uh, 2026. We know elections are going to be very tough. We are in a very tough environment, and we're really trying to make sure that those elections can be as free and fair as possible. So really we'll, uh, welcome any um, suggestions from the panelists. So just a quick addition that part B of the same question but page to Pakistan as well. So that comes from you and but let's to the top the same question. Perfect. Thank you. So AI, like anything else, is a tool, right? Similarly to how I wouldn't use a hammer to put in a screw into a wall, AI is not applicable to everything. But really, in order to figure out where it is applicable, as you're asking, you need to come up with a list of problems you want to solve. What is it that you want to address? And then how, and then, and then based on those problems, I'll then pick the best tool on my tool belt to solve that problem. And so what I often see lacking in a lot of government's action plans is a concrete list of problems that they want to solve and then how AI maps cling to it. There's a lot of prestige things that are put out by the governments of India and Pakistan, et cetera, about like, we want to also be world leaders in military AI. And we also want to be world leaders in, in 5G and quantum or whatever. Those aren't problem statements. Those are just those are just prestige statements. Like we also want to be prestigious, just like all of our partners across the globe. If you can come up with a concrete list of problems that in Uganda, I want to make sure that women have better access to the voting, like the, to the to, to the voting booths, right? Those concrete problems and publishing those lists will get you targeted solutions where AI can actually be applicable, rather than AI is wielded as this vague thing that might be helpful at the end of the world. The other thing is that. We were just talking to our partners in Singapore about this uh, at, at this exercise that they ran for a coordinated HODR response in the region is not everyone needs to be a leader in AI at this current moment, right? AI has a huge cold start problem. You need to have the infrastructure, which costs a lot of money. You need to have the talent, which costs a lot of money and time to foster. And you need to have the right sort of policies in place to make sure that technology is usable. Instead of sort of solving that problem immediately and figuring out how to be, you know, have homegrown and grassroots AI, sort of work with your coalition of partners around you. Currently in Africa, Rwanda and Ghana are two of the world's leaders in AI, at least in, in the African region. So instead of sort of relying on just, you know, AI being built out of Uganda, maybe let's, let's work with our partners in these countries to build the technologies there, deploy them locally and use that time where we're building real solutions to actually start building up that infrastructure, train that talent, to then eventually start growing homegrown technologies. And so really build a coalition rather than sort of setting out by yourselves to solve those same problems. And we have two more questions. We have two This has to be a key. And then there was one here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Johanna Tesfamariam. I currently work at Tetra Tech, which is a company based in uh, on the east side. But I'm here from New York, and I just wanted to join this conversation because I thought it was very interesting. I'm just popping by for two minutes in, uh, on the West Coast. Um, I work mostly, I was working at Columbia University mostly with smallholder farmers, and I work in disaster risk financing. And I think the conversation of AI becomes very interesting when it comes to the global majority because we don't even have the basic infrastructure, such as water, electricity, but yet we're having this advanced conversation about what AI can do for us but the foundation of why our communities are vulnerable continues not to be addressed. So I think the reason I was actually interested in this conversation is to understand what is USAID's way of also being pushed as a donor and as a partner to open up these conversations of what is the basic element that a country requires before we have these next steps of these conversations. How can we push USAID to have a more interactive element of like what is development? At what stage of the development does AI get introduced and who's the one actually utilizing AI in these countries and gets to create these uh, AI jobs, which are now going to be a huge hub. And I think the African continent is going to be uh, the one who's adopting AI, just like smartphones, right? We leapfrogged into smartphones because we don't have the infrastructure. So how do we make sure that the basic infrastructures are still available before we even have these kind of conversations? And I think even the definition of human rights should be um, redefined for for us and the rest. But it would be great to understand how USAID itself can push its internal mechanism and like how AI can be a better process. That would be great to hear from you. 
Do you want me to say now or later? Maybe, maybe why don't we go to, let's go to the next one here and then we can. Hi, um, I am Vaishnavi. I'm currently an independent tech policy advisor and I spent the last 13 years working within big tech companies. And I really resonated with the idea of multi-stakeholder washing um, and companies really picking and choosing who the stakeholders are that they involve in the process or using multi-stakeholder processes as a back channel um, to kind of advance their own interests. And um, since this group represents kind of a, you know, a combination of both academic institutions as well as government institutions um, and civil society more broadly, I'm wondering how you guys can contribute to informing the multi-stakeholder process. So for example, saying you can't only consult with youth organizations that believe the same things as you, you also have to consult with these youth organizations that have different views, or you can't just consult with Western um, you know, NGOs for your final recommendations. You have to include at least X number of countries from the global south in your final recommendations. Um, is that something that you guys are thinking about? And if so, how is that playing out um, in the in the guidance you're giving um, industry? Should I start? Would you like it for both? And then yeah, and then yeah. um, um, I we're happy to also follow up. Like I'll give you sort of a very snippet, but I. I will say even on the question, let me maybe start there and then I should go you. Um, like, and, and the reason I'll say happy to follow up because we have the counselor and mission directors in this room from a number of countries here. So they may be able to comment as well and deputy mission directors. I think for USAID, I think it's fundamentally, yes, it is improving infrastructure. It is making sure that societies and you know, emerging democracies can deliver goods and services for its people uh, across different sectors. And I think it's going out front and thinking uh, through what is a particular country need. We often, before we go into a country, really do that kind of a needs-based, in fact, based assessment to really think through and use evidence to think through what are the challenges in a country, what are the conditions in the country, and what does the country mean, how we as an agency and as a U.S. government as the predominantly foreign assistance arm of the U.S. government can um, go in and help that country towards a more prosperous, stable, and, you know, better future. In those conversations, I think particularly on the front end, as we design uh, not just individual programming across whether we're talking about democracy or economic and growth or climate or food security or innovation, and then the broader you know sort of country strategies, I think this is, there's an opportunity to actually think through how something like AI and emerging technologies, how, where they can be applied and used. And again, it's also just you know going through and even what I was mentioning earlier in terms of human rights impacts assessments, but I think the model, this concept still applies. And that is, think about how AI can be deployed positively, both for development and democracy on the front end, and particularly for the broader development and broader infrastructure conversations and the ability to make sure that we're serving various people across different segments. Um, I think um, those conversations need to be uh, had on the front end. So I will also give you an invitation to have a conversation with a number of colleagues here. Vaishnavi, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for quite a while, it's delighted to see you, delighted to see you. Um, I think um, certainly we don't, I mean, we don't tell, you know, private sector tech companies what to do or who to invite, right? But what we can as a government, but what we can do is in the most stakeholder process and make sure that we are intentionally, when we are facilitating an exchange, right, or as governments general, I think, you know, what we are intentionally bringing the right stakeholders into the room, whether it's from civil, civil society, um, representing also not just global majority, but again, we need to segment that population and fundamentally understand who we're serving, right, um, and bring those voices uh, to the room. Yet, the last thing I'll say to you, and I, I just think about, you know, and I've worked, you know, I also come myself prior to this role in, Sil in Silicon Valley, and that is, you know, we're all kind of serving the same people. You know, when the companies are serving the consumer or the customer or the end users, they're looking at different segments of the populations, regardless of who they are in all of these countries. 
we as governments are doing the same thing because we're there to try to help people and we're there to try to help society. So we, that's why, you know, we do focus on women and girls. We do focus on uh, youth. You know, we do focus on racial and ethnic minorities. We do focus on, you know, persons with LGBT, uh, with LG, I'm sorry, disability and LGBTQ plus communities, whoever all these different segments of the population are. So I think in some ways, while we may come from different perspectives, I, my hope is that we're actually, the intent is there, the, the end user, the consumer, the citizen, it's really the same population. Yeah, maybe I'll go to you. Wait, just a quick yeah. like, final thought mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. Um, I think just to say, completely agree what you say, we can't tell them who to invite, of course, but there are some civil society organizations that is doing a lot of work in defining what meaningful stakeholder engagement is and also what it is to not. Uh, which I think is a little bit easier to say. So ECNL, but also other uh, organizations that are out here. And that's the type of work we want to promote. And again, we can lead by example and show what we think meaningful and stakeholder engagement is. Um, one thing I do want to do, and then I'm, I'm sad to end on a note of promoting my own work, but the fact that we have, so the reason why my title is also global engagement and our office has a global mandate is that we are out there at the different um, events or conferences and speaking with people and make it part of our job to bring that back here. I know that the companies are doing that themselves. Sometimes people would say they're not doing a good enough job at that, but that's part of our role too. And it's part of our role to bring, We every year actually we have a cyber and tech retreat. So where we host together with Australia, we host, I think it's 25 cyber and tech ambassadors from the entire world that are coming here so from every continent to engage with the companies, to have some frank and open discussions. It's like a three-day program, closed door debates, but to actually bring them here to have those conversations. That's with governments, but nonetheless, it's governments from around the world. So there are things we can do while we cannot tell them who to talk with. We can at least try and promote what we think is meaningful stakeholder engagement um, and hope that that kind of picks up. Uh, well, thank you to our panelists and especially thank you to the audience in your really thought provoking questions and to our co-organizers of this event, the Citrus Policy Lab, the Center for Long Term Cybersecurity and the Goldman School of Public Policy. Please join me in thanking our speakers today. Thank you.